Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Cody Eppner. I'm from Cincinnati Museum Center. And today we are speaking with Dr. Nick Dunning from the University of Cincinnati's Department of Geography. Dr. Dunning uh, has helped us and has worked with us on our current Maya the Exhibition at Cincinnati Museum Center, which, as the name implies, dives into the Maya civilization through 300 artifacts. These are all coming to the United States for the first time here in Cincinnati. So it's very exciting to have this exhibition here, but there's a lot to unpack. And we're not the first ones who are thinking about this, who are thinking about researching the Maya, their civilization, and what makes them so uh, incredible and noteworthy. Dr. Dunning and his colleagues at the University of Cincinnati have done a lot of archaeological research in uh, traditional Maya areas in Central America and Guatemala, Belize, and Mexico. And so he's going to share a little bit about his work, his research, and what he's come to learn about the Maya and why they still have so much um, to tell us today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Dunning. Thanks, uh, Cody. I, um, I guess I'll start uh, by saying which uh, is Yucatec Maya for I'm very glad to meet you. Um, uh, Yucatec is, is the one Mayan language that I uh, speak a little bit of. Um, uh, let's get started with the slides, if, if we can set that up. There we go. All right. I will switch to the slideshow. And um, I've got a fair number of slides here I'm going to run through fairly quickly. Uh, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and uh, Cody will be uh, monitoring those uh, and uh, will either interrupt me or, or get to them at, at the end. Um, I wanted to uh, start by just giving a plug for the exhibition, which I've been to and is, is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I've been involved in four other Maya exhibitions, all the others being uh, in, in Europe, uh, and this one is hands down the the best, both in terms of, of the quality of the material uh, on display uh, and the presentation. Uh, if you haven't been, go. Um, these are just a few uh, images from, from the interior of, of the exhibition uh, showing the, the use of uh, pseudo-architecture and, and actual Maya, reproductions of actual Maya murals uh, to uh, frame some of the materials and the diversity of things ranging from uh, massive stone monuments, stela, uh, to uh, utilitarian wares, uh, ceremonial artifacts uh, in all shapes and sizes and materials. Absolutely a phenomenal collection of material. And just some more uh, images from, from the galleries. And... Uh, there is also a, a, a small gallery uh, highlighting some of the work that uh, myself and uh, several other colleagues and graduate students uh, at the University of Minnesota have uh, produced mainly in the last uh, 10 years or so is, is what it focuses on, although uh, a couple of us have been at it for uh, three or more decades in terms of, of our longevity in the field. Um, just to quickly start out, for those of you who may not know what Maya means, um, it, the Maya are one of the indigenous Native American peoples. Uh, they occupy and have occupied the area that's now part of southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and little bits of Honduras and El Salvador. Currently, about 6 million people who speak one of the 32 different Maya languages. Um, a couple of those are virtually extinct, only a handful of, of living speakers, uh, but some of them are, are, are quite large. Uh, and there are at least three times as many people who are of Maya descent, probably considerably more than that. So when we talk about Mayan, Mayan refers to uh, the Mayan language family and the Mayan languages. Uh, Maya refers to the Maya people, both as a uh, noun as an adjective, and you can see the diversity of, 
of things here. And and a Yucatec speaker, uh, I'll just as a quick illustration, uh, a number of years ago, I was with a family in, in their house in, in rural Yucatan, and uh, the uh, a radio station from Highlands of Guatemala came on. They were speaking Quiche, Guatemala. The people could tell that they were speaking a Maya lang or Mayan language, but uh, couldn't understand anything but a but a few words here and there. It's sort of like someone who speaks French uh, trying to understand Portuguese. Um, distribution of those languages. The the map on the left shows. Uh, the, the overall distribution, there's a big blank area in the middle, which is easier to see on the map on the right, which shows the actual distribution of Mayan speakers, uh, is an area which was uh, essentially abandoned at the end of the Classic period, which is something we'll talk about uh, more later on. There's a great deal of cultural continuity between uh, present-day Maya people and cultures, uh, particularly in rural areas. Um, and uh, those in the ancient past. Obviously, uh, modernization to some degree has taken place uh, and interconnectedness with other cultures has taken place, but they are still a people that are, uh, have a very proud history and identity uh, to the current day. Uh, more slides showing continuity. Uh, the fellow in the middle, for example, uh, with his back turned to us, is a Maya shaman, a living Maya shaman in the town of Santa Elena, Yucatan. And he's uh, in the middle of a chachak or rain god calling ceremony uh, to get to try and overcome a, a midsummer drought. Um, most rural Maya people uh, have a hybrid of beliefs that, that include uh, belief in some of the ancient uh, deities, uh, hearkening back to pre-Hispanic times. Uh, the agriculture that's practiced today is somewhat modernized in, in many ways, but in a lot of areas, it's very traditional, still growing the same uh, crops which were grown by their, their ancestors. A quick timeline of uh, Maya uh, existence. Uh, we are people who are distinct enough in terms of their artifacts uh, uh, that we know were Maya going back about 4,000 years, about 3,000 years, uh, the beginnings of, of places, urban places, small urban places initially uh, starts to, to form. And Maya civilization uh, continued up until uh, the 16th century AD um, or CE, the common era. And uh, uh, when we talk about uh, Maya, Mayan civilization or Maya civilization, it goes from roughly 1000 or 800 BC up until about 1500 AD. But the Maya, again, didn't disappear. There, there are lots and lots of them now, and they are still culturally Maya as well as in many cases, linguistically Maya. Uh, the first Maya urban centers, including uh, Guadalajara, as it is now uh, called, um, were quite different than what you see in the classic period. Uh, Guadalajara in the upper left uh, is a platform made out of earth, uh, packed clay, uh, built up over layer after layer after layer over several centuries. Uh, that's about a mile in length. It's the single largest construction uh, the Maya people ever built, um, and it reflects a very integrative kind of governance. Uh, we don't have any evidence for kings and queens, uh, rulers of that sort. Um, it was uh, based around the congregation of people for uh, large scale events in big plazas. By the end of the pre-classic, places like El Mirador, which you see an artist's reconstruction of on the right, um, uh, you start to see uh, pyramids, and you start to see the first glimmerings of, of uh, divine kings and other uh, aspects of, of classic Maya civilization. Um, by the time uh, 300 AD or so rolls around and the classic period is, is uh, fully underway, 
very hierarchical form of government centered on, on kings and queens who viewed themselves and at least promoted themselves as living deities in and of themselves and descended from uh, the first uh, ancestors in, in the Maya creation mythology. They commemorated themselves with, with elaborate stone monuments, uh, both in terms of stela, such as you see in the, in the upper panel, and uh, the decorations on uh, buildings, including very large and elaborate royal palaces uh, at the larger cities. I'm going to talk mostly about, in terms of the ancient Maya, an area that we call the elevated interior region, which runs uh, from uh, Ushmal, which you may be familiar with in the north, uh, to roughly Tikal in the south. This is an area that has essentially no permanent surface water, um, which is very important in the Maya region because there's a highly seasonal distribution of rainfall. It rains very heavily for about half of the year and then is uh, bone dry, more or less, uh, for the other half. And because uh, water in this area, which is a limestone or karst region, is uh, hundreds of feet in many cases below the surface, inaccessible to the Maya, they had to collect and store rainwater uh, <clears throat> to, to live. And if you look at uh, late pre-classic and, <coughs> excuse me, um, classic period cities in this region. They're all centered to certain degrees on reservoir construction, damming off streams uh, in some cases, or uh, enhancing depressions at the bottom of slopes uh, to collect that water. And this was done on a multiple scales, big urban reservoirs that held uh, literally tens of, of uh, thousands of, of gallons of water uh, to just household tanks uh, and cisterns. Um, just a quick example showing some of the uh, scale differences in, in uh, a series of reservoirs at the site of Chactun in Campeche, Mexico. These are, are LIDAR images, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a, in a moment. Um, you can see the some of the range in, in size of these all adjacent to uh, either large residential groups or large monumental architecture groups. All right, so well and good. The Maya learned to collect and store rainwater very effectively, uh, which allowed urbanization, allowed population to be concentrated in places within this interior, elevated interior region. But that creates a certain amount of vulnerability because if you get a drought, and particularly a severe route, and that's your really your only option is to build more reservoirs, which in a good year allows you to concentrate yet more people. Ultimately, you get to the point such as the Maya reached in the terminal classic period, roughly 800 to 900 AD, where <coughs> when some really, really bad droughts hit, um, the number of people that were dependent on those reservoirs had risen to a point where the results were quite catastrophic. Um, the Maya region as a whole is uh, visited by periods of intense drought, uh, not mega droughts that last for decades, but periods when there are droughts of two, three, four, even five years at a time that pile up on one another uh, over a, a relatively short period of time. And that happened uh, most uh, pronounced in the terminal classic period in the ninth and 10th centuries AD, <coughs> which is when places like Tikal and Ushmal and Kalakmul uh, were all effectively abandoned. One of the things our team at the University of Cincinnati has been looking at is not only the reduction in the amount of water available, but also the quality of the water. If you are collecting water in reservoirs and the um, water level keeps going down and you can't flush out the reservoirs, they eutrophy. Uh, you get algal blooms, uh, you get phosphorus, uh, the uh, palace, the kitchen for the central palace at Tikal, 
for example, was located right on the edge of the Palace Reservoir. Uh, they threw the waste from that into the reservoir, um, and that added to the, the problems in that. We're using this, uh, showing geochemical measures here, uh, phosphorus levels within some of the reservoirs. <coughs> Just in the last two years, we started doing something very novel uh, in my archaeology, which is looking at ancient DNA. Organic sediments in, in places like reservoirs will preserve fairly effectively ancient DNA. In a reservoir, that's going to be mostly algae, uh, bacteria, and other uh, microforms of, of life. Um, but as we're working with now, if you, if you go through it carefully enough, you can also start to pick out uh, trees and crops and foodstuffs and uh, uh, so forth. But this here just reflects um, a, a couple of uh, <clears throat> algaes and, and uh, blue-green algaes, which proliferated particularly in the central reservoirs at Tikal in the Terminal Classic period during the period of droughts. These produce toxins, uh, which would have been uh, extremely dangerous for, for human cons uh, consumption. Um, we also discovered using geochemical assays uh, that uh, the Maya, if they were drinking out of the palace and temple reservoirs right in the heart of Tikal, adjacent to the royal palace, so it was presumably the, the water main water source for them, would have been ingesting over time, particularly as water levels dropped during periods of drought, a fair amount of mercury, which is not a good thing. Uh, you get enough and it kills you. You get enough less than that, less than a toxic amount, it can uh, lead to insanity, and it can also lead uh, to obesity. <coughs> One of the last known Maya kings of Tikal is a fellow whose name translates to Dark Sun. Now, this is his image here on a lintel on, in Temple 3, a uh, big old uh, belly protruding out, uh, whether he was suffering from mercury poisoning, we we can't know for sure. His burial hasn't been found. It's probably in Temple 3, but it, it has not been excavated uh, to date. Um, if so, if his bones are recovered, then that could actually be tested. But having a crazy ruler um, is not necessarily a good thing in a time of crisis. Let's leave it at that. All right, how do we know what we know about the Maya? Um, one of the things is the Maya wrote about themselves, particularly in the classic period. Um, and uh, this does open a window uh, into Maya life, uh, but really only into royal Maya life because the inscriptions are almost 95% of them deal with the lives and times of, of royalty, of, of rulers, their marriages, um, their children, their uh, conquests, a uh, very militaristic society in the, in the classic period. Just a quick aside, one of the most exciting personal moments in terms of my uh, Maya archaeology career uh, happened back in 1987, working on my doctoral dissertation. I was mapping a uh, site, uh, Yashri Labpak, in, in the Puk region up in Yucatan State, uh, and this was on my day off. My workers had the day off. It was Sunday, and I was just out cleaning up my notes, walked a little farther along one of our, where one of our next mapping transects was going to go, and came across this platform, which was covered with some fairly large stones, which, uh, as I start to, to look at them a little more closely, I realized they were stela. These are dynastic monuments from the rulers, uh, the kings of, of Yashche Labpak, I managed uh, to turn one of those portions of one of those over by myself, and there was this dead king, the face of this dead king, staring up at me from from down on the ground. I I danced a jig, screamed, hooped and hollered, and uh, carried on otherwise out in the middle of nowhere. No one no one was there to hear me. But uh, the next day, uh, with the workers back, we were able to turn uh, some more of them over. Unfortunately, um, <coughs> the majority had fallen. Uh, face up, so the uh, sculpted portions had been uh, almost completely obliterated by erosion, but there were a couple, uh, Stila 3 and 4, that preserved 
uh, images of, of the ruler. The, these are not uh, a lab, particularly nice stela. They don't have long inscriptions. <coughs> this particular ruler, uh, Lord Jaguar, uh, uh, Balam Ahau, is, is named in the glyph compound up at the top. Uh, the Maya also wrote books. Uh, only four uh, have survived. Um, uh, the Spanish, uh, Spaniards, excuse me, did a very thorough job of uh, collecting and burning the majority of, of them, any that they could get their hands on. A few made it back to Europe uh, and were preserved. <coughs> and one was preserved in a, in a very dry cave. Um, it's so more can be found potentially, but uh, unlikely. Um, the books that we have uh, are essentially almanacs uh, that are uh, meant for uh, helping, among other things, predict droughts, recording droughts, and therefore uh, forming a record to predict droughts, uh, such as the Dresden Codex here. Uh, the Maya exhibit at the Museum Center has, has a beautiful reproduction of the entire, of one of these uh, entire codices, uh, which is worth seeing just in and of its own right. Um, a lot of what we know is from traditional archaeology, what you think of with archaeology, that is painstakingly uh, removing uh, soil and rocks and uncovering what is left or preserved behind uh, the collapse in areas. Um, uh, just a number of photos from that. Uh, that's my green hat over on the right, uh, talking to a graduate student about stratigraphy in the side of a, a reservoir, which is one of the things we've been working on very much so at the site of Yashno Ka, where our current project is, is located. Um, one thing I want to say about archaeology today is it, it is not Indiana Jones going out and looking for tombs. It is large teams of people, uh, local workers, scientists from uh, multiple countries, the Yashno Ka project team, from a couple of years ago is shown in the lower right-hand corner. Um, the, uh, it's a, a, a Mexican, Canadian, and American project. Um, and uh, there are specialists who work on, on the ceramics, who work on the, on the uh, stone materials, who work on the plasters, who work on the um, <coughs> soils and sediments, who work on the, the biological remains. Uh, it's a big team effort. Uh, it's very complex. And uh, because archaeology has gotten so complex, it's also very expensive. Fortunately, uh, uh, our UC uh, crew has been very successful in getting funding, uh, particularly from the, the uh, U.S. National Science Foundation. I myself call myself a geoarchaeologist. I look at the interaction between people and the environment uh, via agriculture, among other things, and look at <coughs> the history of landscapes uh, as recorded in both uh, the remains of things like agricultural terraces. Um, you can see this uh, cross-sectional diagram, a place worked in Guatemala a few years ago. Uh, field wall dividing two plots, agricultural plots running downhill here terraces cross-secting it, and buried soils, which uh, to me is the most exciting thing I, I uncover these these days. Uh, this from Yashno Ka, where you can see a soil which developed, a soil surface which developed between about 800 and 550 BC, followed by a period of destabilization. That is, they were clearing and constructing things upslope from here, generated a lot of erosion, which buried that soil surface, it stabilized again, another soil uh, formed on top of that. Activity resumed up on here without any terracing or other means of controlling it. And a whole bunch of new uh, sediment roundup burying that. The beautiful thing about uh, these buried soils is they preserve ancient pollen, uh, ancient DNA and other things. So we can tell what they were growing uh, on those things. We can also tell that by analyzing the pollen, uh, phytoliths, uh, charcoal, and uh, DNA that's found in uh, reservoirs uh, that are found out within agricultural complexes, uh, such as this, uh, also near, near the site of San Bartolo. 
Uh, San Bartolo murals, by the way, feature prominently in the in the museum exhibit. And the problem with reservoir sediments is that the Maya had this habit of periodically taking the sediment out in order to keep the capacity of the reservoir up. Uh, so here, for example, we go from uh, sediment preserving uh, manioc, uh, maize, and other uh, cultigen pollens uh, in the pre-classic period. And then the classic period's missing entirely, and all of a sudden we get uh, sediments from the post-classic abandonment. Okay, LIDAR, a great tool which has been in, just in the last decade introduced into, into Maya archaeology. Uh, that Danny. allows us to image large areas at a time of the surface. Uh, this is airborne LIDAR or, or uh, lasers. You send down literally millions of laser pulses down over the top of the forest as the plane flies across the top. And a certain percentage of those get through the tree canopy, find gaps between the leaves and branches and so forth, and uh, get reflected back up uh, to the plane, which records them. And you can sort it all out uh, with supercomputers and get an image of what the ground looks like. Here we're comparing a uh, standard aerial view in real color of a section of forest over Yashno Ka and what it looks like in the, in the LIDAR image, the digital elevation model. This big complex here, complex Fidelia, big pyramid com on a triadic pyramid on a platform and a large reservoir. You can see the reservoir here a little bit because of the greener vegetation, but there's no way you could tell that there was a a uh, large pyramid complex under here, let alone all the hundreds of, of house complexes, these squares, each of these patio groups is a different household uh, within, within that uh, society. Just another quick example of that, flying over a portion of Campeche in Mexico, we can see field walls and little house mounds within them. These are essentially farmsteads where you have the uh, field house or the homestead uh, in the midst of, of the area that was controlled, plot of land that was controlled by uh, that, uh, that particular family. And this is what it would look like if you were flying over just in a plane, uh, just green and green and green, although there's been some modern clearance in a few areas here. <coughs> now, all right, to finish off, talk a little bit about uh, the post-classic and modern era uh, again, the elevated interior region, uh, which we've been talking about, the heartland of classic Maya civilization, largely abandoned uh, during the droughts of the 9th and 10th century AD, some reoccupation. But uh, again, the people that were living there, some of them indeed probably died off, uh, but the majority went into areas that were less densely populated in the surrounding areas, places like Chichen Itza, Mayapan, uh, Tulum, which have natural water sources. The soil isn't as good, uh, so agricultural possibilities are, are more limited than they were uh, in this area. Uh, but coastal trade, which rose dramatically, big ocean-going canoes uh, rose dramatically in the post-classic period. This is roughly 900 uh, to 1500 AD. And then comes the 16th century and the Spaniards arrive uh, and things get very ugly in many different ways. Um, the Spaniards uh, did not invest nearly as much in the Maya region as they did in central Mexico uh, because the Maya didn't value gold and therefore didn't mine it or collect it. Um, unlike the Aztecs in central Mexico who uh, viewed gold with the same passion that the Spaniards did. So the Spaniards invested most of their military might uh, on places like central Mexico and Peru, where there was lots of gold. It took about 40 years for the Spaniards uh, in the first half of the 16th century to subjugate <coughs> essentially just the northern uh, third or so of the Yucatan Peninsula, um, leaving the Maya more or less alone. Unfortunately, they introduced smallpox and measles to which the Maya had no herd immunity whatsoever. Uh, and it killed off over a century about 90% of the Maya population, even those who'd had no direct contact with the Spaniards. 
Uh, the Maya also resisted uh, very fiercely. There was no central government. There was no Maya empire, just lots and lots of uh, smaller city-states and other forms of, of kingdoms. And they rebelled numerous times. This image here of, of the first uh, seat of the first bishop of Yucatan, uh, it's heavily fortified, and it had to be because the Maya tried to uh, get to the bishop uh, a number of different times uh, in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries. The most successful Maya uprising in terms of, of almost driving uh, the descendants of the Spaniards, this was after Yucatan had gained, Mexico had gained its independence. Yucatan declared itself a republic separate from Mexico uh, for a period of time. <clears throat> and then the Maya uh, rose up in that area and literally almost drove the Spaniards, ruling Spaniards, off of the peninsula. Um, the Republic of Yucatan asked to rejoin Mexico. The Mexican army came back uh, and a stalemate eventually uh, arose about 1851. Um, and, but a, a Maya state, John Santa Cruz, existed independent of Mexico in what is now uh, most of the state of Quintana Roo, where uh, uh, Cancun is, uh, for uh, more than half a century. Um, and uh, only only eventually was was brought back into Mexican control. Um, you may have seen a news item that appeared in a number of outlets uh, about two weeks ago. Um, the identification of a sunken, uh, what was referred to as a Mayan slave ship. This originates from the War of the Castes uh, period in the uh, early 1850s. Uh, where, as as the Maya were being resubjugated, um, a fair number of uh, them were essentially taken as slaves and sent off to Cuba to work in the sugar plantations uh, there. But one of one of the vessels sank uh, just off the coast of Yucatan. Okay, the Maya are still on the move. Um, the drivers of that movement that causes Maya people to migrate to places like the United States. Uh, one is a continued uh, poverty and lack of economic ac opportunity. Uh, there is still essentially a subjugated an economically and to some degree politically subjugated population, particularly in places like Guatemala and El Salvador. Um, Less so in Mexico, but certainly it, it exists in Mexico as well. Uh, the Guatemalan Civil War, uh, 1954 to 1996, is essentially a Maya uprising, as is the Zapatista conflict, which began in Chiapas, Mexico, in 1994. Uh, there, there's a detente between the Zapatistas and the Mexican government right now, uh, Zapatistas still control about a third of the state of Chiapas, uh, and Mexican authorities are not allowed uh, in those areas. Um, but even within there, there is, is tremendous poverty um, and lack of opportunity. And these have driven a lot of people uh, to try and get to the United States and other places to, to find better opportunities. You may know the name Rigoberto Menchu, uh, who was the recipient to, in 1992 of the Nobel Peace Prize, a Maya activist from Guatemala, who has a very strong statement among many strong statements here uh, that the Maya are living people and that they want respect. They want uh, to be given opportunity, but they don't want to lose their identity uh, as, as the price of that. Um, one of the issues facing Maya people coming to places uh, like the United States today, if they arrive on the border seeking asylum uh, because of, of ongoing civil wars or uh, gang violence or any of a number of, of things, is uh, many of them speak one of the Mayan languages, speak little or no Spanish. Uh, there are not translators available. Given the diversity of Mayan languages, that complicates things. Um, and of course, uh, whatever policies for immigration are in place at a given uh, time, 
uh, in, on the United States border uh, complicates that as well. There is our, our, act, our living Maya communities within Cincinnati. Um, uh, I can't give you the numbers. Uh, most of them are from uh, Chiapas, either Tzotzil or Tzetzal speakers, uh, or from uh, Western Guatemala. Uh, very few from uh, Yucatan, uh, and there are very few Yucatec speakers, which I could possibly help with, but uh, uh, it's it's a it's a complicated situation, and I will leave it at that. I should point out that, that the exhibit features the living Maya as well as the ancient Maya. Uh, the the focus uh, of of the artifacts and so forth is largely on uh, the ancient Maya, uh, but um, it, it is again important to remember that that this is not simply a an ancient civilization created by a lost people. That is. Uh, very, very far from the truth. And with that, I'll say thanks. And if anyone is still on and has a question, I would be happy to. We we do have a few. Okay. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take these in the order they came in. So we'll be fair. Elizabeth asked if you have a. Uh, a favorite object, or if there is one that is the most breathtaking for you from the exhibition? Um, yeah, I, uh, I, it was one I had never seen before. Um, uh, it's been so, probably about eight years since I was last in the National Museum in Guatemala City. I gather this is an artifact that has been on display there uh, starting about a year or so ago. It's the the uh, uh, god impersonator that's crawling on the ground, a big, huge stone uh, monument. Uh, never seen anything like that. Um, uh, and, and I've been to quite a few Maya sites, quite a few museums. Um, and that, that's just extraordinary. Um, most Maya sculpture is more or less two-dimensional, like the stela that you see uh, incised in, in what's known as a bas-relief uh, style, um, which is very effective. There are places uh, like Copan in Honduras and Tonina in Chiapas uh, where they made full round um, stela. Uh, but that's the exception rather than the rule. And, and in general, uh, three-dimensional full round sculptures are, are pretty, pretty, pretty extraordinary. And that one is simply phenomenal. And I, I believe the one that you're referring to, um, they're wearing, are they wearing um, a Jaguar costume or? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a, is the Jaguar? What role does that play? in well, well the Maya Jaguar, the Jaguar in in Maya belief, in Maya cosmology, is associated with the sun. Uh, the sun, as it, the Maya, like all ancient civilizations, thought of the sun and other planetary bodies as going around the Earth. Um, and in the Maya conception, the sun goes through the sky, the overworld during the day. And then has to go through the underworld, in which case it takes on the guise of a jaguar, uh, which is a nocturnal beast. And the jaguar was much admired by the ancient Maya. Uh, jaguar pelts uh, feature prominently in uh, kingly costumes uh, and and so forth. Uh, uh, and uh, these impersonator rituals where a ruler or other elite person dresses up as a deity, um, sort of, I guess, sympathetic magic is, is, is one way of thinking of the way that that is thought to work in the minds of, of people who practice it. That is by impersonating the rain god or impersonating the sun as it moves through the underworld, you take agency over trying to control a natural force. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
we'll see if anyone chats in that they <laughs> that they want more on that. But I think that's fascinating. Um, we have a question from Mary. We actually have two questions from Mary. So she's doubling down. Okay. How can you, when, um, when you're looking at soil samples, how can you tell it's an ancient soil surface and, and how is that different from erosion soil? How, what do you see that distinguishes those two? Um, excellent question. <laughs> uh, the, it's, it's a somewhat complex answer. I, I, I'm not going to simplify it too much, but I'm not going to go into all the details. Usually the most visible um, difference in, in the example I showed, uh, the buried soils are darker uh, because they have been, they were sitting exposed at the surface over um, anywhere from a few decades to, in, in many cases, uh, a century or two. And during that time, they take on organic matter, leaf rain during the dry season as, as the forest sheds its leaves in response to, to the lack of rainfall. And that accumulates over time, just like the A horizon, the topsoil uh, in, in your garden is generally darker than what you see, see below it. And what gets washed down on top of it usually includes uh, sediment derived from not only topsoil upslope, but uh, subsoil lower layers. In the case I was showing there, quarry debris also, and that buries it off. Um, you can also look at that buried darker layer and it will show signs of having had soil structure, little clumps or blocks uh, that develop uh, as soil matures. Um, and those are still preserved within there as well. And you won't see that in, in the stuff that washed in on top of it, which tends to sort of be laminated. And then finally, even in cases where you get a really old buried soil where the organic matter has, has demelanized, has lost its color, you can still chemically tell uh, by uh, some of the um, uh, elements that tend to concentrate in, in the topsoil, like phosphorus, uh, can still uh, do it even if it's, if it's lost its color. Um, okay, I hope that's enough. That's that's great. Another question we have: Do indigenous Maya help with any of the excavations or interpretation? Or are they are they helpful in deciphering ancient writing, or has that sort of been forgotten by um, the Maya today? Well, um, indigenous Maya form, uh, by and large, the the partially skilled workforce uh, in our in our groups in the sense that they're the local people. In the case of Yashinoka, there is no living community right where we're working. They're, they're about five hours away, the nearest village. Um, uh, most of these people are of Maya descent. A few of them are Mayan speakers. Uh, Chol, in the case of, of the people working with us at, at Yashinoka. Um, they're disconnected from ancient Maya civilization in terms of, I mean, the, the Spaniards absolutely wiped out indigenous literacy. Um, you still see Maya writing about uh, themselves uh, after the, say, mid 16th century AD, uh, but they're using Latin script. Um, uh, they, they adopted, uh, the, the Latin script converted Maya sounds, Mayan, the sounds from Mayan languages into, into Latin letters uh, and continue to write about themselves and still do. That said, um, one of the cool things that Maya epigraphers or some Maya epigraphers have started doing in the last, mainly the last decade um, and uh, mainly in Guatemala, although it has now started in in Mexico too, is these are the epigraphers are people who have learned to read uh, ancient Maya glyphs, um, and uh, they are now uh, formed schools to teach 
how to write Mayan languages in the indigenous script. Uh, so it's being revitalized. There is even a couple of towns that have carved their own stela, uh, sort of dedicatory uh, town square monuments uh, with Mayan uh, script, uh, talking about various aspects of, of, of their town. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, Maya people, living Maya people do teach us a lot about um, what ancient Maya agriculture uh, and forestry practices were because a lot of those have continued. Um, when I was uh, doing my dissertation work many years ago, one of the things I was doing was trying to map the distribution of ancient settlement versus different soil types. And what I used for the different soil types was uh, Yucatec Maya terms for those soils because um, figuring that that was a better window into how the their ancestors interpreted that landscape in terms of where it was best to plant certain crops, uh, where it was going to be, what were more drought tolerant, what were more fl flood prone, uh, all of which is is embedded within the indigenous language uh, descriptions for for those soils. Okay. What the when we talk about um, downfall of the major city states is that primarily climate change or is it a combination of climate change and drought and the the infiltration of the Spaniards? Uh, okay, that's that's a fairly complex. Uh, again, I'll I'll try not to oversimplify, uh, but not get too bogged down in details. They're, they're sort of two separate things. The, the Spanish invasion in the 16th century AD is essentially 600 years after the collapse of classic Maya civilization. So places like Tikal had been abandoned for essentially five or 600 years uh, by the time the Spaniards arrived. Um, and those in big interior cities like Yashnoka, like Tikal, like um, uh, Kalakmul uh, were, were largely vacant um, by the time the Spaniards arrived. The Spaniards did reap destruction on occupied Maya uh, communities. Uh, uh, the city of uh, the modern city of Merida, Yucatan, the capital of Yucatan State, for example, is built on the flattened remains of uh, a, a large Maya town called Tiho. Um, Isamal, which I showed the picture of the big convent, also built on uh, what was one of the larger Maya uh, towns uh, in the uh, when the Spaniards arrived. Again, largely obliterated, uh, but not entirely, um, uh, to build the Spanish uh, buildings on, on top of that. Um, climate uh, and as a cause of the classic Maya collapse and the pre-classic Maya collapse in the third century AD, it's commonly agreed on now that we, we certainly have abundant evidence that there were severe droughts during those time periods. It's a little, scientifically, it's, it's a little iffy to say, yes, we have this strong correlation in time between droughts and abandonment of cities. Um, correlation does not in and of itself mean that there's causation, um, but it's a, it's a pretty compelling case if, if you look at uh, the way that the cities were abandoned. One of the things we're trying to do with our reservoir work at Tikal and Yashnokov though, is, is to look at some of the, the mechanisms that would make drought so um, detrimental to urban centers in the in the elevated interior region, uh, like Tikal. Uh, again, if you're not only having not enough water, and most of the most of the agriculture is also rainfall rainfall dependent, so your crops are going to be going down. Um, you have a lot of people. Uh, there had been essentially good times agriculturally uh, for 
a number of centuries leading up to the classic collapse. So population had been steadily climbing over, over many centuries, uh, and it set the Maya up for, for really severe downfall. Uh, there are those who look for more uh, behavioral um, aspects to, to the collapse and the abandonment of, of places. Um, Maya rulers were not necessarily very connected with the populations they were ruling. Um, and if you claim to have a special connection or agency uh, with divine sources like the rain gods and it stops raining, um, who's going to believe you? Um, there, just one final thing here, a, a couple little vignettes, I guess, uh, archaeologically discovered vignettes uh, from different, two different sites in the Maya Lowlands. Um, these are, these are, or excavations in households, just just your average farmer living on the on the edge of a city. Um, in one case, we see a series of houses abandoned, sort of in sequence over a number of years, and the people realized they weren't coming back, and they 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 essentially performed what's known as a termination ritual at the front door of the house, where they would make an offering, they would sacrifice certain artifacts, probably a turkey or something as well. Um, and, and they would uh, block off the house. In some, in some instances, we have examples of people would literally collapse a building uh, in order to kill it. Um, this is something that which would be very hard to do because the Maya buried their uh, ancestors in the floors of the houses, not live burials in the sense of, of a freshly deceased person, which would be rather smelly, but this is somebody who has been desiccated or skeletonized elsewhere, and then they put an offering along with the person as, as part of the claim that, that you are, you know, this is our, this is our house, this is our, our, our residence, and the places get bigger and bigger over time. And so leaving some place like that permanently knowing you were leaving would be really hard to do and that they would have a ritual commemorating that we're leaving we're going to we've got to find someplace else would be really a, a heart wrenching decision <clears throat> another site uh, i know of you find kind of the opposite behavior where you see people leaving behind carefully hiding um, some of their household artifacts making a little cash behind the house, uh, covering it over, um, apparently with the intention of coming back. Okay, we'll go live with our extended family members uh, in, in some place that has a better water source than we do. Um, and then when things get better, we'll come back. They obviously didn't come back as those carefully stored materials. But again, very poignant idea of this, this hope that went in into that decision that they would um, be able to come back and resume a normal life. Um, but uh, sadly, it, it, it wasn't in the cards. Well, Dr. Dunning, thank you. I, that's all the questions that we had come in, but they're really good questions. Um, I, think, I think some of these people would do well in your class, or at least they'd be very, very <laughs> engaged learners. Uh, thank you so much for, for spending the time with us and giving us a little bit of your expertise on the Maya. For those of you who would like to learn more, you can always visit Maya the Exhibition at Cincinnati Museum Center. It is open now. And as Dr. Dunning said, there is a section on the research that he and his colleagues at the University of Cincinnati have done on some of these Maya sites. And it's really enlightening because it adds that scientific aspect to it. It adds that archeological um, process aspect to it and what we continue to learn. While a lot of the exhibition is who they were, how they lived, this is unpacking more of that story um, beyond just what we may read uh, in the Stella about kings and, and gods and things along those lines. So if you haven't visited, please make sure you come out to Cincinnati Museum yes, Center. Yes, do. It's, it's, it's spectacular. Even for an old Maya hand, it, it uh, 
that got my Maya juices flowing and I will bid you a Maya farewell. Uh, Yucatec Mayan farewell. Kashi'ik Tech or Te'ish Utsil. Good luck to you all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Don. Yep. Bye.